So say we all! On March 16th, 2009, the actress Natasha Richardson fell while skiing on a bunny slope in Canada. She wasn't wearing a helmet, but she also wasn't going fast. She got up, talked, joked, walked back to her hotel. An hour later, she developed a crushing headache. An ambulance was called. She was flown to a hospital in New York City, but it was too late. After her death, physicians interviewed used the phrase talk and die syndrome to describe how after a fall, someone can get up, talk, walk away, unaware they've experienced a life-threatening injury. I remember exactly where I was when I heard about Natasha Richardson. I was on a ski vacation in Utah, sitting in my sister's kitchen. It was a snowy day. The light was bright. The conversation veered from the actress's role in the parent trap to whether a helmet would have made a difference to the unbearable helplessness her loved ones must have felt when it became clear things were not okay. The shock and disbelief, the what ifs and if onlys. I started to cry, sitting there at the kitchen table in the bright white light, remembering an ordinary morning. I'd made blueberry muffins for my kids, nine-year-old Olivia and eight-year-old Jack, including three blueberry muffins without blueberries for Olivia, who hated fruit of any kind. <laughs> Having delivered the kids to school, I'd done a load of laundry, walked the dog, paid some bills, and was on our landline with a dispatcher about delivering a new bed frame for my non-fruit-eating daughter when I heard a beep indicating another call was waiting. It was the school nurse. Olivia had fallen playing tag during recess. Though she'd gone back to class afterwards, she was now in the nurse's office because she didn't feel well. Could I come get her? Thinking about the delivery I just okayed, I almost said I couldn't come right away, but then decided the bed frame could wait. We lived just up the hill from the school, so I was there within minutes, found a rare parking space right in front, and went straight to the nurse's office. Olivia was little enough to pick up in my arms, so I did. She said her head hurt. She didn't remember what happened, but the nurse said a few boys, including her brother Jack, had been with her when she'd fallen. They'd reported she hit her head. The scalp, the skin over the skull, is on average seven millimeters thick, nearly as thick as the skull bone beneath it. Quite often after a hit to the head, blood pools under the skin and a bump forms, a visible sign of injury. There was no bump, which I thought at the time was a good sign. But for some reason, rather than putting Olivia in the car and heading home, I decided to call our pediatrician before leaving school. The lack of a bump does not mean there has been no injury. It can mean the injury is deeper beneath the bone. Just as I got through to the pediatrician's office, Olivia said, Mommy, I can't see the clock. I remember this distinctly, and I remember asking someone to call 911. After that, my memory is spotty. The school was located next to a fire station, and the paramedics were there quickly. Somehow, Olivia got from my arms to the floor of the principal's office. Men in uniforms circled her body. She was so little, lying there surrounded by all of these boots. At some point, someone, maybe me, must have called my husband who worked from home because he was suddenly there too. By then, Olivia couldn't see anything at all, and she could not feel the left side of her body. An acute subdural hematoma occurs when blood builds up rapidly between the brain and the dura mater, putting pressure on the brain. Symptoms include severe headache, weakness on one side of the body, changes in vision or speech, and loss of consciousness. Someone in a uniform took me aside and asked for permission to airlift Olivia to Children's Hospital. A helicopter would be better because an ambulance could hit traffic even with the sirens and flashing lights. 
They'd put the school on lockdown. The helicopter would land on the playground. This could all be done in a matter of minutes. There was a caveat. I could not stay with her in the helicopter, and I desperately wanted to stay with her. But while they were explaining all this, Olivia lost consciousness. Yes, I said. Yes, to the helicopter. We should leave right away then, they said, and meet them at the hospital. When I responded, I couldn't leave her, someone said, there was nothing I could do for her, which nearly took me down. The nurse offered to get Jack from his classroom so we could bring him along to explain what had happened. And I remember worrying aloud, this might traumatize him. And the nurse saying, you should have him with you. And knowing she meant just in case. So I nodded, and she went to get Jack. He came walking down the hall, littler even than Olivia, wearing this brave face. And I knew I needed to keep myself together for him, which was a good thing, because when they wheeled Olivia out onto the sidewalk, hooked up to oxygen, strapped tightly to a backboard, I wanted to scream. I wanted it all to stop. I didn't want to believe it was real. I was not there to hear the chopper blades or the lockdown alarm. I did not see them load her into a helicopter, and I do not remember the drive, other than that I called my sister to tell her what was happening, to ask her to call everyone else, and though I am not a religious woman, to pray. Untreated a subdural hematoma can result in severe brain injury, paralysis, and death. When we arrived at the hospital, my husband dropped me off and I ran in. I told someone, it must have been a triage or registration nurse, that my daughter was being airlifted. And, if I, and I remember her saying, wait here, a social worker will come speak to you. And knowing right then, Olivia had died en route. And I said, she died, didn't she? And there was about three seconds maybe before the nurse answered. And in those three seconds, a part of me shattered. But then she said, no, 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 she's not here yet. The helicopter is still on the way. The social worker brought us back to a bright hallway, and within a minute or two, the double doors opened, and they wheeled Olivia in on a gurney, still trapped in, still unconscious. They took her into another room where the social worker explained they would prep her for a CT. She told us a neurosurgeon was available if surgery was necessary, which was both reassuring and one of the most frightening things I'd ever heard. The social worker said it was fortunate, in a way, that Olivia was unconscious, because it was important to remain still for a CT, and children are often afraid of the machine. And I thought, what if she wakes up inside the machine and she's scared? I wanted to go to her. I wanted to trade places to bargain with whatever was controlling the universe. I would die for her. Please, let me die for her. But I couldn't. Jack was there with us. I held out my hands, and he climbed into my lap. The social worker asked him to tell her what happened, gently posing questions. And for the first time, I heard the whole story. They'd been playing tag, Jack said. And Olivia was running to home base, a railing next to the sidewalk. She slipped on the grass. It was wet, Jack said. And she hit her head on the railing, hard. And then she fell and hit her head on the ground on the sidewalk. She didn't get up right away, he said, turning to look at me. But then she did. She got up. She talked. So he walked her to her classroom, told her teacher. I leaned down to my little boy, aware on some level that what I said next might matter later. And I whispered, you did the right thing. Acute subdural hemorrhage usually develops after head trauma, forceful enough to cause a temporary loss of consciousness. In the minutes to hours after the injury, the person usually recovers consciousness, but then gradually loses consciousness again. The next few hours are a blur. I don't recall interventions or the order of events. I know at some point the neurosurgeon came out to tell us they were preparing to drill a burr hole into Olivia's skull. But then her condition improved. She vomited once, twice, regained consciousness, began responding to questions. And at some point, we were allowed to go in and see her. 
the social worker talked us through how to behave, what to say, how to touch her, how not to. I thought of all the things I might have done wrong in those first few minutes when I picked her up in my arms. What if I'd loaded her in the car and taken her home? What if we hadn't called 911 or the fire station hadn't been next door or the helicopter hadn't been available? What if she was never herself again? Because for the next few hours, Olivia was not herself. When a doctor asked her orienting questions, including, and who is this, pointing at me, Olivia answered with a big smile, the President of the United States. But then that evening in the ICU, she asked if I could bring her a movie the next day. She wanted to watch How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And I allowed myself to think, maybe she's going to be OK. Olivia lost about 24 hours. The last thing she remembers was eating a blueberry muffin without blueberries. Now 27, she doesn't remember playing tag, or the accident, or the paramedics, or the helicopter ride, though she wishes she did remember that. She was lucky. When things were going wrong inside her skull, just enough things went right. But a couple of months ago, while completing paperwork for a new psychologist, Olivia saw, for the first time ever, a question about past head injuries. Shortly thereafter, she learned that a young man she'd known in college who struggled with depression before taking his own life had experienced a subdural hemorrhage and concussion like hers. She began exploring the link between brain injury and depression, and she began to reconsider the accident on the playground 18 years ago. Before that day, she was a happy-go-lucky little girl, serious, but always smiling. After, after the world became darker, and darker still, something she still struggles with to this day, life is full of risks, what ifs and if onlys. I know this. Olivia began skiing at age three, and we always made her wear a helmet, even on bunny slopes. But in the end, we could not protect her. In the end, it is quite possible her life changed with a simple fall on a patch of wet grass as she ran for home. Thank you. Anastasia Hipkins, everybody.